like to say hello and welcome everyone. We are here to talk about the impact of Ardmore, Oklahoma, Carter County, formerly known as Pickens County. My name is Cedric Bailey, a native of Ardmore, Oklahoma, born and raised in Ardmore. And I am so honored today to have with me some people who have been just asking me to tell this story. And before I go any further, I want to say thank you to Mr. Gary Raymond. Gary Raymond is located in the historic part of Ardmore where it all began. And he is there, Eastside Renaissance. He has a lot of history, a lot of information. And my job is to tell the story. Now, I'm going to introduce two people. And then we're going to bring our guests on board. We want to say hello to Verdi. We want to say hello to Sandy. We want to say hello to Linda. But the man who's been reaching out to me for the longest is Mr. Terry Ligon. How you doing, Terry? I'm doing well. And hope they all uh, are having a great evening and enjoying the new year. All right. And then also our friend, Dr. Dorsine Spigner Littles. How you doing, doctor? I'm doing great. I'm very pleased and honored to be here among this august body of people and where we hope that like minds meet and spread a little information to All right. people that don't know their heritage and their history. Now, Terry, I want to say something about Dr. Littles, okay? I remember growing up in Ardmore as a kid, seeing the Spigner Hotel right there on Main Street. And I knew, as a matter of fact, my my uh, auntie dated a, a Spigner back in the day during that time period, and this was in the 60s. But I want to say that Dr. Littles was at the Ardmore Douglas reunion, and she spoke and, and had this great plan laid out. It's just that I said, man, the reunion was fine. You know, we were sitting there listening. And I said, this woman has so much knowledge. And then we hooked up and we, we were able to talk with Angela Rosley Walton, who by way of Maryland, who's originally from Fort Smith, Arkansas. And I said, we got too much history here in Southern Oklahoma. So what we're gonna do is Terry and Dr. Dorsine, we want to hear a little bit about you, Terry going first, and then Dr. Dorsine. We wanna know, Terry, your connection of Ardmore and then Dr. Littles, because I know your family is from out in Milo and, and Tatum and all that part and, 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 and of uh, Carter County. So Terry, you're up first and then we'll go to Dr. Littles. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to say that um, I didn't grow up in Oklahoma, but Oklahoma, and I didn't live there, but it lives in me. I've been researching uh, the history of the Ardmore and surrounding areas for more than 30 years now. Um, my particular expertise would be the Chickasaw and Choctaw freedmen. Um, with that, I have discovered that our connections to each other and to that geographical area intersect so much that it is a responsibility and obligation, not only of me, but the rest of the Freedmen descendants that we preserve this history, that we publish this history, and that we do everything we can to uh, make everyone else aware of it. Because when you start to look at the issues surrounding Ardmore and the people who descend from there, we're invisible. And it's time to make us visible with our history because it is impactful. Uh, it has uh, an essence that should not be ignored. At, at the very most, it should not be ignored by us. I can't take uh, responsibility for what the state does. But for us, we have to accept it and start promoting it. And the rest of my story, I hope to get into as we go forward with these discussions. All right, now we're gonna be bringing other people on board and there are people that are watching this live on Facebook and we want you to be sure if you can raise your hand or if you have a question or so, use the chat room and be sure to share your comments. But uh, Dr. Littles, we wanna hear from you and if you could just uh, set our opening statement and tell us a little bit about yourself and what we need to know about the history of Ardmore but from an African American perspective. Okay. Well, I'm a product of, of three different communities in Carter County. I was born in Ardmore. I later uh, 
moved uh, to Newport, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and grew up around Newport, Milo, and uh, those areas. And also, my grandparents uh, moved from Texas to uh, to Tatum's, Oklahoma. So I so I, I share history with three different communities in in Carter, uh, County, and so I have always been a secret historian. And when I went to college, I was dis discouraged from studying history. Mm. But everything you love, it comes back to you. And so gradually, over the years, I was doing research and I was thinking, that, finding out things that were amazing about our culture, about our history. And I have always thought that uh, this knowledge should be shared and so I'm on a mission. Uh, I'm speaking next week at uh, on a, at a uh, June. I mean, sorry, Martin Luther King Day uh, event. And so since uh, for the last year, since critical race theory has been under as uh, under a threat, my goal is to teach CRT critical race truth. Wow. That's my statement. All right. Well, let's go ahead and, and uh, share some things. I'm going to tell you a little bit, and then we're going to open the floor up a little bit from the history that I know. When Ardmore was first established, it was done during the time period of Indian Territory. Now, the year was really, it was 1887, which if you go back, Dr. Littles, it, it came to the African-Americans being slaves to the Indians. And we had, in, in just alone in, in the Ardmore area, in Carter County, which was formerly Pickens County, of the five civilized tribes, we had everybody there but the Cherokees. So we had the Seminoles, we had the Choctaws, we had the Chickasaws, Chickasaws and the Seminoles. And during that time period, I think Tishomingo was probably with the capital during that time period. Does that sound right, Dr. Littles? Yes. Yes. And so here we are. It was the headquarters of the Chickasaw. Yes, and that's in uh, Johnston County. But during that time period, there were over at least 7,000 Blacks that came in and they had multiple Trail of Tears. Is that correct? Yes. And they came from different areas. And here in Ardmore, we had the Choctaws and the Chickasaws, and they came here. And so the Indian Nation was established like I believe in 1819. Does that sound about right? So that was way before slavery. Yes. So then, that's when the treaty started for the, the US government. My dad, who's not on here, and I'm going to do this and get him on here. Sandy had told me because she had spoke to my dad earlier today, but and he's always talking about the treaties. Was it the treaty of 1864 or 46? What was that treaty? 1866 was the treaty after the Civil War where uh, the Native Americans had to give up their land held in common. And um, so that was what broke the tribe's uh, uh, hold on massive amounts of, of, of land. Right. Terry, you want to comment on that? Anything you want to add before we go on? Well, um, I guess in connection with my particular uh, concentration uh, study, of uh, the two trees Treaties that are important to me is the 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek and the 1866 so-called Reconstruction Treaty that uh, emancipated the uh, enslaved people of the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations. Mm -hmm. um, I think when we look at the history of Ardmore, we I also have to, and you you touched on it with the establishment of the fact that enslaved people came here with the removal from Alabama, Mississippi of the Choctaws and Chickasaws. And that would have occurred in the 1830s and 1840s. So when you talk about black people uh, in their uh, footprint on Indian territory, we can go back at least 40 to 50 years prior to statehood. And I think yeah. that's one of those important facts that we cannot um, overlook when we talk about the history of Ardmore because it all comes back to play as the history goes forward, as we became invisible, as the tribes ignored us, uh, ostracized us, uh, and we are looking at effects of that today in the um, educational, uh, 
uh, the financial and social issues that are plaguing that area. Gotcha. Now, I, would Dr. Like, I would like to add. Um, Go ahead, because I was getting ready to bring you back in because I needed to ask you a question. And that okay. was also about the uh, the Creek Nation and the Cherokees. I believe, I, well, I know for a fact, the Creek fought with the um, with the, the North, where the Chickasaws and the Choctaws fought with the South during the Civil War. Is that correct? No, all of them were divided. They all were divided. They were all divided uh, because uh, each each one of the tribes was seeking more freedom and, and more of their rights. And they thought that the South would give that to them. And, and also they thought the North would do that. But mm -hmm. psychologically and, and because of slavery, the majority of the tribes si sided with the um, with with the South, but they were actually doing it for their own gain because they thought that they would gain more sovereignty under under either the South or the North. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my screen right now, and Dr. Littles, you should see the state of the all black towns in the state of Oklahoma according to the Oklahoma Historical Society. And I, if you I see, have something on my screen that I can't. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how to move. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and can everybody see my uh, screen and see all these towns on here? I can, yes. Okay, so I'm going to share this with you. If you look, everything that's in the red, those are the current towns that are incorporated today. There's only one south in Carter County, and that is Tatum's. But believe it or not, north of Tatum's, there was a little area called Bailey. And then east of Tatum's was an area called Homer. Dr. Littles, you familiar with that area? Yes. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, I'm on the board, uh, uh, he is, his family was from, that's near Hennepin. Yes. Yeah. So when, you, so leave, when you leave Carter County going into Murray County, that's what you're looking at, correct? No. Uh, no, oh, Garvin okay. County. Okay. Homer. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's another another town that's not on there that's mm -hmm. close to Hennepin. And I thought it was Homer, but it, it's another name. I got you. And you okay. know, and it's, it's amazing that you said that because I got another message that they said outside of Berwyn, which is now Gene Autry, there was an area called Blackjack. And I said, I never heard of that. I so, think I heard of Blackjack. You yeah. heard of that? You uh -huh. know, but all this is, is you got to understand all the African-American people lived out in that area. They yeah. migrated to Ardmore later on. Is that correct? Uh Everyone that was in, in that lawsuit, Terry, the, was, what was the name of the lawsuit? Uh, equity case equity. 7071. Yeah, everyone of, of those names are people that lived in Milo uh, and, and, um, and around Milo and, and uh, Newport. And, and I, I think somewhere in Springer, but all of those names that are on that, on that document are if I, can, if I can add to that. This, and this is this this map is one of my pet peeves <laughs> because you can see where it says early towns established in 1880. Now all of that is factually true, and you have your all black towns that are established there. But again, we can't forget our history, starting when the removal came and when the uh, for enslaved people were emancipated. They established communities that predate this. And that's what you're looking at, Berwyn, Bernieville, Culvert, Hennepin, Homer, Stonewall, Wiley, Woodford, Winniewood, Paws Valley. All of these communities had sizable freedmen populations. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, Mr. Bailey, when you called me the other day, I was in the middle of creating a spreadsheet on Berwyn. And there were over 80 families there with over 400 people that were established at least by the time of the Dawes Commission. So when we look at this map, we're overlooking a great part of our history. And as Dr. Spigner says, you know, the outlying areas of Milo, Newport, these areas contributed to the culture and society that began became Ardmore. Yeah, you're right about that. Dr. Uh, Spigner, anything you want to add on to that before we move on? Yeah, I think Homer is is that 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 uh, city that's next to Hennepin mm -hmm. because it looks like it's right next to it. 
And one of my colleagues uh, went down there and found it because his family was originally from there. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go back to the Trail of Tears. Uh, what's overlooked with the Trail of Tears is that the Black people that accommodated and that uh, traveled with the Native Americans were slaves. Yes, correct. And so they removed much of the burden from the Native Amer Americans, as bad as it was for the Native Americans, the uh, African Americans was going ahead and clearing the trails. They was going out finding game and, game and killing the game and, and preparing meals. When the people went, became ill, they were the nurses that took care of them. And so more Black people, uh, per, uh, per numbers, died on the Trail of Tears than the Native Americans. But that is not talked about because they, they were slaves and they were working uh, all, of, all the way from Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, wherever they were coming from. They were at work uh, taking care of their masters along the Trail of Tears. Yes. If I may, if I may. It's, it's interesting that you say that because um, a few years ago, the Chickasaw Nation had a video up on their website. And in that video, they claim that the runaway slaves came to their tribe for comfort, mm -hmm. ignoring the historical record that clearly points to the fact that they had enslaved people with them on that African, on, I'd like to call it the African Trail of Tears, but on that Trail of Tears. And you will find, and because I've also done this work, I've gone through every Chickasaw Choctaw Freedman card. And I tried to pull out every person who fit the age group of someone say 55, 55 years old and older who probably came on that trail. Mm -hmm. And we have a substantial number of people that we can document with their names because when they came on that removal, they have what they call immigration roles. And you'll see with the Chickasaw Nation, uh, one of the uh, enslavers, Benjamin, Colonel Benjamin Love, brought with him over 100 slaves. And, the, and those people have no names, but we can go back now and look at those DOS cards and correlate that information to identify those people. Okay. So again, our history tells us a lot more than we're given. And if we don't really pursue it and, and pro produce it, publications on this information, people will still simply ignore and tell the same old stories that's been told like the Chickasaw Nation tried to tell that uh, farce about people running to them for refuge. Didn't happen. That was the Seminoles. No, exactly. Was... They, they, they tried to co-opt the Seminole story. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we confronted them with that and they pulled that video down, never to be seen again. Wow, I hadn't heard that one before. Well, well let that's me, what I'm here for. Well, let me go ahead now and <laughs> go ahead and share my screen again. I'm sending a, a picture here, but let's go back to something. Now, let's go back to Ardmore, the establishment. We know that Ardmore came in existence in uh, July of 1887, okay? And I also have that map of what it looked like during that time period. I'll pull that up in a minute. But the first actual ever building anything was the old 700 Ranch. And that was, it, it's kind of like a story where, you know, during that time period, you had these brothers, they were the Roth brothers. And what they were doing, they were moving cattle all up and down from the Arbuckles and going down. And so <clears throat> the location of where that took place of where the, the ranch was, the 700 Ranch, which now the city of Ardmore has moved it and they have located it at uh, 35 Sunset Street, which is near the old Walker Stadium. But this ranch was built uh, by back in 1872. And so you had these Roth brothers that were going there at that time period, and they were moving cattle during that time period. And so that location was at the corner of 2nd Avenue and G Street, Southeast in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And that land is exactly, the reason why they needed that location is because that's where they had to, um, to water their horses and feed their cattle during that time period. 
So the history of Ardmore started right around the corner of Burton Street, right there on 2nd Avenue in G Street. They later moved that building, that 700 Ranch, out where the Hardy Murphy Coliseum. Do you remember that, Dr. Lewis? I hope she's still there. She can hear me. Uh, are you talking to me? Yes, I am. I said no. that they moved that ranch and put it out at the Hardy Murphy Coliseum. Right. Mm -hmm. Now they moved it in the 90s and they put it out there where the museum is. Now I'm going to share my screen with you at this time period as I get back to that. And you shared this picture with me and it has the first actual building establishment that was created in Ardmore, Oklahoma back in the day. And that would have been the Westheimer Dobby building. Is that correct, Dr. Little? Which yes. is on the screen. Does everybody see that building right there? Mm -hmm. Now, what's so unique about this picture is there are four black men in that picture. And these are all lawyers. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, Ardmore had a substantial number of lawyers and doctors uh, during that time. That is correct. And and John Hope Franklin's father. Buck is, Colbert? Uh, yes, Buck Colbert Franklin. Is the one who did that. Now, now, tell us a little bit about that and how that connects us from Ardmore to Tulsa for Black Wall Street. Okay. Uh, well, John Hope Franklin was actually born in Ardmore. Mm -hmm. And uh, his parents came there. Um, I, where, I forgot where they were from, but it uh, seemed like they were from Carter County or Pickens County. It, it may have been Homer or Wiley, I believe. Yeah, that's what I was told, that land out there near Tatum's in mm -hmm. that area there, and they own quite a bit of land during that right. time. And the Franklin family, which some of them still live here in Oklahoma in Ardmore, some of them are from Paul's Valley, too, as well, in Garvin County. And some of them are related to me. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in uh, Ardmore area are connected through some some means. Yes. But yeah, John Hope Franklin was was uh, born in Ardmore, and um, he uh, his dad later moved to Rennesville, moved the family to Rennesville, and they were they were looking for places where they needed a lot of lot of uh, uh, legal advice. Mm -hmm. So after they moved to Rennesville, his. Uh, uh, Dad decided to go to Tulsa because Black Wall Street was being developed and was so prosperous. So he left the family in Rennesville, and but he set up an office in uh, in Tulsa, right in the middle of Black Wall Street. And uh, Black Wall Street, for years, w when they did uh, start talking about it, they denied that the airplane, that the National Guard and some of the uh, uh, rioters uh, were in in uh, small airplanes and they were dropping turpentine bombs on the on the buildings. That's why Black Wall Street was burned so thoroughly. It was burned from the top down yes. because they were in airplanes dropping those turpentine bombs. But the the historians and the people from Tulsa denied it. Mm -hmm. And um, within the last five or six years, John, uh, uh, John Hope Franklin found a, a note that his father had left. Yeah. And his father walked out of his office. And, and I have the handwritten note. I have how he described it when he saw these uh, things dropping down from the sky and falling down on the buildings. And the buildings would immediately go into... Uh, into flames. So he turned that note over to the Smithsonian. And that is verifying that Tulsa was, was burned from the top down. And now no one can deny it because he left that documentation as proof. And wow. it was found uh, at a timely times it, during the uh, 100th year anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. And you know what? I don't know if you've been to Tulsa lately, but I went up there this past summer. And when you go downtown, they have the baseball field that's right there. They have the historic yeah. church. They have the memorials. They have everything that's right there. It is commercialized. Yes. Yeah. And the white people are making money off of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then 
you'd go down and in order to get there, Terry, guess what street you got to go down to get there after you get off of Greenwood, Archer and Pine. They got yeah. a, a named after Mr. Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> right there. In fact, I, 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 this is nothing to do with the, with the meeting, but I was uh, teaching in Tulsa. Uh, I was when I was at OU, we we uh, taught in Tulsa on the Tulsa campus as well as the OU, the Norman campus, and it was really really cold. And it was like in November, uh, November or December. My class was on the weekend, and so I there was a parade when I took the break, had my class to take a break. There was a parade. And so I didn't know what the parade was about. And so I asked somebody, I said, what the parade about? And they said, they're naming the street after uh, John Hope Franklin. Mm -hmm. And so I ran out there to see the, see the parade and John Hope Franklin was standing out there. So I ran over there and spoke to him and we got into a real deep conversation. And then I realized, I said, it is so cold out here. I might kill John Hope Franklin. <laughs> So I told him, go ahead and get in the car, sir. We'll talk later. <laughs> wow, that is a great story. But you know, that's history that you're able to share with us. So when you go to Tulsa, you can see all this. But here's the here's the interesting thing, everybody. Guess where he went to school at? Dawes Academy. Where is that located at, Dr. Littles? Gene Autry. Berwin. Well, we, we don't <laughs> say Gene Autry. We, we don't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Irwin, it's now Gene Autry. They changed the name because Gene Autry came through there. <laughs> I know. So just get it out your mind. That's all very <laughs> funny. I, 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 I'm sorry. Notes and everything. Old, old habits die hard. But, I understand. <laughs> but let me, let me just say this. When you, here we are, most of the people, the Roberts family, Ned Roberts, all of them, I'm looking at there, you can go out there today and ride out there and look at that church. And when you get there, there is a slab on the corner of where this historic school was during that time period. And I was reading some of the notes about Dawes Academy and, and, and Dr. Little, I don't want to mess it up, but it was named after a lady. Is that right? Oh, I'm not sure. I, I haven't read hey, that. What do you know about Dawes Academy? Tell me. Because I know Angela knows all that stuff. And we're going to bring her on later. But Dawes Academy, the impact, what it did for African Americans. And keep in mind, it wasn't nobody driving to school, wasn't riding no bicycles. They was walking. Dawes Academy is similar to um, what you have over at Jehovah, <laughs> what you have in other places where the churches where the uh, educational St. institutions were. Right. St. John's was one of the, was my mother. When I started doing research, I was finding my mother's history, you know, because mm -hmm. she, she attended the St. John Academy. That was a Rose, Rosenwald, uh, Rosenwald. Oh, yeah. Rosenwald. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, like those steps in the building is gone. It's again, it's our responsibility to preserve that history. Yeah. And you know, and then I found out they had Robertsville, you know, and then the foundation of that time period was the black churches. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, I, th I think if Marilyn Band was here, uh, because when, when, a, when a black settlement was not a town, like in Texas, it was not a not called, called a black town, they were called colonies. Mm -hmm. So that's what the black settlements were, they were like colonies, because they to be a town, you had to have a post office. Uh, and and uh, in Texas, they called them colonies. And when the people from Texas came, they didn't, uh, the ex-slaves, a lot of them didn't move into the back towns. They moved in surrounding areas in settlements around the black towns. And they called them colonies like they had been called in Texas. And see, this is what, that little image you see behind me is a plat map. And that's what I'm using to work with the information from the Dawes cars to show visually these communities of freedmen that we can establish where we actually lived. So because it's not taught, called a town, it's not called a black town, but there's a viable community there that yeah. is continually ignored because it's just been overrun by Southern whites and, and the, the natives 
who claim it to be their land. But you see those little pink squares? That's all Freedmen land. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. So we, we can't ignore the documents that establish our presence there. Yes. So, and, and keep in mind, most of our parents' birth certificates and they had on there either A, you were a Negro or you were colored. That's what it said during that time period. And most of the time, you had midwives that delivered you. Is that about right? Well, some of the earliest records you'll see as far as vital statistics go are contained in Dawes records. Uh, yeah. You'll see birth, marriage, um, uh, there's basically birth and marriage records. Mm -hmm. Even some, yeah, some death records, death certificates. So your first vital statistics before uh, Oklahoma became a state are contained in the Dawes records, the land allotment records. Yep. And that's where you will find somebody takes the time to compile a list of midwives. You're and, right. And also, if you, the map that you have, normally uh, there would be a church one or two churches whenever whenever two or three gather together they would find you know they would form a, a church so that would be another way to trace how the settlements uh were named yes you're right so here we go i'm gonna open it up after i share this screen and here we go <clears throat> it says the darkest tears of the trail of tears the darkest tears among the choctaws and the chickasaws was little is said about the many blacks that traveled to Oklahoma with the five civilized tribes and the Choctaws during that time period. They were described as civilized because they changed from normic ways to a life that won more righteous. Now check this out. The Chickasaw had 1,273 African-American slaves, some who went along with the black and Indian ancestries uh, of Lightfoot. The Choctaws had at least 512 Blacks with them. 11 free Blacks, slaveholders, were, of course, chief. Uh, I can't pronounce that name, but their name is listed right here. And it says, of the Chickasaws, they, these were slaveholders of Mr. Colbert. So remember that name, Colbert. And they he's had- all the, He's all over, the, all over the place. Yes. And then it said it was Blacks with the Creeks and Seminoles. Once again, I want to say thank you to Gary Raymond for making this possible. So, you know, I've been holding on this stuff for like three or four years. I met with Gary, we sat down and, and talked about things. And I told him I was gonna do this. And I just had to just figure it out because we were just meeting, we were dealing with COVID. And so it's a lot of stuff that goes on. And this goes back to 1831 and 1833. You know, by 1894, there were 4,406 folks of African descendant among the Choctaws. The Dunro gives information about the Chickasaw Freeman, and it gives you that information on the film. In 1894, there were 3,376 African descendants among the, Choc the Chickasaws. And then it goes on and talks about Congress and the third session and what was going on during that, 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 that time period. So remember now, Oklahoma was intended to be called the land of Lincoln. And that's what Angela had told me. It was gonna be Indian territory. Talk to me, Dr. Littles. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, I, I, have, I have read that, but I can't uh, talk definitively about it, so I prefer not to read any, any, any information that I'm not sure of. If yeah. I see something, I'll, I'm pretty sure of, of, of my facts. And if, well, my okay. friend and research, the fellow researcher, Ryan Graham, who is of Creek descent, in uh, part of the Creek Nation, uh, he has given presentations on the land of Lincoln, where he actually has a map where it has written on it, land of or Lincoln on it. So mm -hmm. the, there is some documentation that establishes that as being the fact. Yes. So now we're going to ask, uh, we're going to go to the people that are on. Uh, if anyone, you can unmute if you have any questions that you want to ask, uh, of course, uh, Terry or, of course, uh, Dr. Littles. Just wanted to make sure that we give you a chance. We'll just mesmerize them, <laughs> make them speechless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a pleasure. My name is Verdi Triplett. Do you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's a pleasure meeting everybody. And Mr. Bailey, uh, there are a lot of people from the Ardmore area 
that migrated to Fort Coffee, Oklahoma. And I'm sure that you all probably know them. Uh, do you know any McCursons in Ardmore? Oh, oh my goodness. Yes. Okay, the McCursons, uh, Henry Huday McCurson or McKesson migrated here from Ardmore and his family descendants live here in Fort Coffee to this day. Wow. Also, also the uh, I do have another connection to Ardmore. Uh, my brother-in-law, Jake Black, John yeah. Black. Yeah, we know them too. All right, they are from Ardmore, T.C. Varner and, and all of them. Ooh. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is very interesting and very informative. Let me my, his my history, I am Chickasaw Friedman. And I come out of the rentalist line of the Chickasaw uh, Nation. And as Perry said, and, and I agree with him 100%, this history definitely need to be told. Because when I discovered my history, it was very, very, very uh, exciting to me to learn that I'm a blood Choctaw Indian. I come, out of the Dor I come out of the Dornil line of the Choctaw Nation. And what was so interesting to me was I found out that my great-great-grandfather was the last sheriff and executioner for the Choctaw Nation. Wow. That wow. I wouldn't have known if I hadn't gotten in contact with people that are staunch researchers as far as I'm concerned. And that's Terry Ligon, my friend Terry. And Angela Walton, Raji, and Tana Holloman, those people are just amazing in their research. And I've learned a lot from them. But this is very interesting history. As a matter of fact, Fort Coffee here, I can see Fort Smith, Arkansas from my sun deck now where I'm sitting. And of course, Fort Smith, Arkansas, was the gateway to Indian territories. That's where Judge Isaac C. Parker's courtroom was. That's where all the civil and uh, and criminal uh, crimes were litigated. And Fort Coffee, the majority of the people in Fort Coffee are Choctaw Indian, Choctaw Freedmen Indians. Yes, it's a predominantly black town. But uh, most people here are Choctaw Freedmen Indians. Yes. Dr. Little was wanting to share something with you. So go ahead, Dr. Little. Yeah. Uh, the, um, two of my best friends in the world are Roy and Flossie Thurston. She's a McCurson. She's a McCurson. And she had an aunt that lived in, in a Coffeeville named Aunt J JB. Do, do, you know, do you know her? Uh, no, I haven't heard of that name. Okay, and and uh, well, it might, I think it was Coffeeville, but uh, um, Jake Black, um, his great grand great great grandfather, back in the twenties, they made a movie about Tatum's Oklahoma, which was one of the fifty all black towns, and it was called Black Gold because Tatum's was a washing in um, in oh, yeah. oil. And so many people in Tatum's became wealthy. And so Jake Black's um, great grandfather, there was a, a movie maker named uh, that was uh, Norman Norman Studios. At the time, he made what was called race movies. Race movies were movies that were positive about black people because he was a black person. He had a studio in in Florida. So he got in contact with uh, uh, Jake's grandfather, got in contact with uh, Norman Studios and told him about this prosperous town in, in Oklahoma and that he needed to make a movie about it. And he did. I wish I could share the screen and show you the, the, the movie. Uh, uh, I just created where I shared the screen. So if you want to, you can do that, okay? Uh, I, I, I'll have to find it and pull it up. But, it, we'll, but we'll anyway. Jay Black is my brother-in-law, by the way. Oh my goodness! Well, anyway, he uh, his his great grandfather brought, bought the uh, filmmaker to Tatum's. The filmmaker bought everything from the studio in Florida and the actors. And then when they got to Tatum's, they hired a lot of local people uh, to be in the movie. 
and it was very exciting. And uh, the, the poster is, is beautiful. And uh, anyway, they thought that they had, uh, they have lost the actual film, but they still have some of the, some of the uh, 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 posters and things like that, and they re recreated them. Well, but, the, uh, the McCursons, the McCursons were what they call state Negroes that migrated uh, from North Carolina up through Texas and into Springer, Springer, Oklahoma. And that's where they lived. And then Henry, uh, Henry uh, Hugh Day, that, that was his nickname, uh, McCasson, he migrated here, but stories are that he apparently killed somebody in that area and he had to flee. And he came here and changed the name from McCurson to McKesson. Really? So wow. here, the last name, or the last name here is McKesson. Mm -hmm. That is a common story when people kill a white man in the South and they change it. My husband, my late husband, his family were Mitchells and, and somebody killed a white man. So they got to Arkansas and um, they were in Alabama, Mississippi, but when they got to Arkansas, it was three or four brothers. And so they changed the name to Little so three of the Littles came to Oklahoma and one went to Omaha and he was Malcolm X's grandfather. You know, I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's Omaha why we, Little got to be Malcolm X. That's, we, that's why we got you on here. But let me share my screen again. So here we go. Before you, before you go there, let me, let me, oh, is that Kwame? That yeah. is, that is the McCurson family on the right. I was going to bring Kwame that up. Family on the left. And this yeah. is the that we went to, of course, a park uh, that's right there called Fraley Park, that where we have a, a, a monument there to remember their legacy. Now, the interesting thing about being in Ardmore during that time period, that was a park where African Americans could not go and hang out during that time period. Really? It was on, on P Street. And they called it Negro Park. I'm just being nice. Is that right? <laughs> and and uh, Mrs. McCurson, Alf, um, Kwame, and Flossie on the at, the at the last two on the end, their mother was the first black woman mayor in the United States. Really? Yeah. Yes. And, well, and did, did, did any of you all ever meet a, uh, a guy by the name they call him Lieutenant? He That's owned the bar <laughs> he owned the barbecue place there on Maine. I yes. used, to, I used to work for him as a kid. I worked for him. We yes. called they called him Jack. I called him Mr. <laughs> Person. That's all I yes. got. <laughs> well, I was I was visiting Ardmore once and I was told by Miss Black that he had a barbecue place. And I went and visited with him. And when he came out to meet me. I looked at him and said, oh, my God, you look just like the McCassons there in for a coffee. <laughs> and I told him who I was. And I mean, the food was on at that point. I mean, he took care of me, gave me some of that good barbecue, and he made his own special uh, oh, gravy, but his own gravy. special gravy that he gave me. And I'm telling you, man, it's, I mean, I've gone to Ardmore a lot in the past. I mean, and I just love the rich history of Ardmore and the people there that have such good generosity, man. They are some of the best people that you can meet. Well, let me, let me and, share and, and, and the most fun. And let me just <laughs> share this with you. On Friday night, as you look at my screen in the background, Main Street had businesses lined up all in down Ardmore. And people would cross the tracks just to eat Lieutenant McCurson's barbecue. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And I've he, heard that. I've heard he, that. And he lived on F Street. If you lived on F Street Northeast, that was a prominent neighborhood where doctors, S.M. Lackey, of course, uh, prominent people in Ardmore lived on that street. Is that right, Dr. Spigner? Yes, uh, E.R. Spigner lived on that street. And it was the first paved street for African-Americans because all of our streets were dirt. 
he was he was uh well you you know he was he was kind of wealthy i was going to i'm not wealthy <laughs> so, so so i want to i want to make that clear but my grandfather was and behind cedric's you see the street that's main street at the at the top of the street that that is probably the railroad track yeah mm -hmm. on on the right side uh nearest to the railroad track is bl owens was bl owens but my grandfather owned every building from the railroad track for two blocks mm -hmm. but he didn't own bl owens but he owned all the buildings uh for two blocks and that B.L. Owens was a warehouse that they kept all the furniture and they took the furniture across the tracks. And, and, and there's one person in Ardmore that's still alive today, uh, and that's Charlie Cox. Right. He worked for a Texoma typewriter. I wish we could have had him on because he could have shared so much knowledge. So maybe next time we can bring you can go and pick him up and, and, and make him a part of the discussion. Well, we're just doing this because Terry asked me to do this thing. And I said, okay, it's now time to share this. So we're putting this up on our YouTube and people will be able to um, be able to share this because we don't have anywhere in Ardmore. We hadn't even talked about Ardmore Douglas. <laughs> I was gonna, um, Cedric, if you don't mind me sharing a few things. Um, yeah, I'm Sandy, Sandy Bruce. Um, Williams, but um, my family um, has a rich, rich history from Ardmore. Go right um, ahead. We're listening. Go ahead. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, my mom, um, she just passed away in October, but literally she would talk about Ardmore from morning to night and could just recite every street and who lived next door to each other and who was who and she just grew up there. And one thing she always told me, which I think one, one person told me at one point, it's like Ardmore, Ardmore was so um, racist and segregated. I, but one thing my mom always said was, regardless if, if it was racist, the black people knew each other and the black people had their own and they had their own businesses, their own fun, their own social life. And so she said, whatever the white people had, the black people had as well. And she said, we didn't really, really, you know, kind of intermix, so to speak. But she said, um, we just had fun. And she loved her life growing up in Ardmore. Um, she went to uh, Dunbar and she actually went to Douglas High School. She was one of the first um, um, female drum majors that Ardmore had. Um, Armour Douglas had. And so she was in so many parades and she was in the homecoming, uh, on homecoming cars and, and just so many things. And, you know, there was a big migration of a lot of the um, African Americans from Ardmore to Phoenix. And I grew up with names like Ragsdale and Lackey and uh, Mr. Nash and the Berries and just so many names that I grew up with. And I knew that history of Ardmore also by going back with her every four years to the Douglas Ardmore, Ardmore Douglas reunion. Yeah. So I just grew up that way. And I feel like even though I'm not from Ardmore, it's kind of my second hometown. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I will always share those memories that my mom had and held dear to her heart. Um, I talked to, to uh, Charlie Cox just a few weeks ago when my mom passed, and he's doing extremely well. So yes, I think we should have him on this panel as well. Right. And by the way, to those who never saw her mother, she was one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Could I read my opening statement? Because uh, I, 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 I okay. In the, in the segregated society of past years, W.E.B. Du, e. Du Bois described in the souls of black, black folks as black folks living with double consciousness, which is reacting and behaving a certain way in a structurally racist society. As a black person, 
you had to behave a certain way in the presence of white people and to be yourself around black people. Did I say white people in the presence of white people and be yourself around black people? This created internal conflict, both emotional, psychological, and physical. So black enclaves like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Deep Deuce in Oklahoma City, and the east side or across the track in Ardmore were necessary because here you could find supportive networks and solidarity for black people suffering from discrimination in a broader society. Mm. Discrimination and, and second class citizenship forced many black Ardmore rights to create their own communities and social spaces where they could live freely and were, were respite from a divided society. And so I, I won't read all of it, but that, that was how I wanted to explain the solidarity of, of Black people in segregated. So segregation in a way was bad, but in another way, it was wonderful. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Because it created wonderful lives and wonderful experiences. Yeah, Absolutely. It and helps. That's exactly, that's exactly, no, I was going to say sorry, that's exactly what my mother would say. Um, like I said before, her her statement would always be, um, "Whatever the white people had, we had it as well, and it was better." You know, so um, she would that always is, say that. that you know, uh, whether it be a dance or you know, um, you know, again the food. She talked about the Hamburger Inn. You know, Charlie Cox's place. Um, she talked about so many things, and I, I know so much about Ardmore um, through my mother's eyes and, and you know, basically how she was at, um, when she grew up. And it, it basically, to me, again, um, kind of reminds me of the, the best little small town that you can think of, you know, um, for Black people. And I'm just amazed at... Um, it literally could have been a little black Mayberry, you know, um, with all those types of people. You know, my grandmother, she talks about how my grandmother would be on the porch uh, listening, to, listening to Stella Dallas in the day while um, the kids were playing, you know. So it was basically literally like a little small town atmosphere, but everybody knew each other and it was such a rich community. I'm gonna share my screen. And everything you said is true. Back in the day, as you see my screen, this page was put together back in 1987. Lillian Chris, who attended First Baptist Church, Chris. wife of the legendary okay. coach, Tim Chris, yeah. put this together. Yeah. P.R. Nash, yeah. Mitha, Mitchell, Barnum, yeah. all put this together to recognize the African Americans that made it. Now, when Ardmore started, it was Indians and African-Americans with a few white settlers. Word got out. People started coming. The Dobbies came. The Westheimers came. The uh, the nobles. Now, I'm going to say something about those no the nobles. If you notice on the east side of Ardmore, you have on the highway the Noble Foundation. They're still uh, going well today because of Lloyd Noble. And then there was Sam Noble. And they live, as a matter of fact, back in the day, the outskirts of Ardmore is where Will Rogers uh, uh, Kindergarten Elementary School was. There was, the only highway that went through Ardmore was either 70 or going north on 77, going up that way period. Now the town expanded in 1886. There were professionals that came, a number of businesses, I'm calling them out. They had beauty shops, 11 of them. They had a confectionery shop, three shoe shine parlors. They had two drug stores. They even had hotels. They had plumbers. They had at least three funeral homes, six nightclubs. Main Street was bumping. They even had a detective, a private eye company, a mason contractor, seven carpenters, two lawyers. They had a dentist. And, and even today, we have a dentist like Dr. Philip Washington is there. We have different businesses that are here. We have the McGee's who have hair salons here in Ardmore. Now, going back to you, Verdi, I want you to know that Mr. John Henry Black was a salesman. And he worked downtown at Otasco's. Before that, Mr. Black was selling. So, yes, John and Jake. And then, of course, his wife's name was Gwen. He always worked. And he was able to get over there 
downtown and have a job. Does that sound right, Dr. Littles or, or, or Sandy? Yeah, and, yeah. and later well, on, he worked at a, 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 one of the prominent uh, male uh, health care haberdasheries. And so he he had quite a quite a uh, job description. When whenever he uh, wanted to work, he could work. And sometimes he would open up his own taxi service. So yeah. He, as a, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I know one of the taxi drivers, uh, Jonas Epps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they lived across the street from my mom and my mom and um, her family. Um, and uh, I think Burl Epps still lives in the house today. So uh, she's, yeah, she's still alive. Uh -huh. Yeah, the girl's still there. But it, it is funny, um, exactly what you were just talking about, Dorseen. Um, that's exactly how my parents grew up. Um, they never were, were basically without a job because somebody had some kind of place, you know, some type of business where you could work. My father, um, his father, his uh uh grandfather was glenn bruce and he had one of the nightclubs or one of the domino parlors i guess on main street at some point he had it with um i think his name was um glenn bruce and um oh i can't think of his name right now but it's on the tip of my tongue but anyway um there was always somebody that you could get a job you know through and whether it be somebody at the bakery or somebody um, at a at an automobile, you know, workshop place or something like that, mm -hmm. um, everybody was able to somehow, you know, make a way for themselves. And I think, you know, it was such, like I said, just an amazing rich community. Well, well and, one, and may I inject something? Uh, one of the one of the most amazing things that I really really admired about the people of Ardmore is they are very, very, very ambitious, very ambitious mm -hmm. people. And they have a network that's out of this world. Uh, as a matter of fact, I attended Langston University and mm -hmm. there were a lot of people that attended that school from Ardmore. Mm -hmm. They were younger than me, of course, Jake Black, my brother-in-law and Doug Colbert. I don't know if you all know him or not. <laughs> And then Ricky Hornbeek, of course, they were from Bernieville, but they were from the Ardmore area. And, and then the McCursons. The McCursons were very ambitious in business like people. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the McCursons that came here, they are very, very, very ambitious. As a matter of fact, Mr. Henry Huday McCasson Sr. has uh, grandchildren that that lives in Oakland, California now that have successful businesses. So I love the ambitious aspect of the people of Ardmore and they always, in other words, had their hustle on. They hustle never That's exactly slept. Right. That's exactly right. I remember again, like I said, through the migration, um, once they moved, several of them moved to Arizona, they then kept up the businesses, just like the Ragsdale. Um, uh, Lincoln Ragsdale and his family had the Universal Memorial um, uh, um, insurance. Yeah, yeah insurance and uh, the, the funeral, home. funeral funeral directors. Yeah, they were mm -hmm. funeral directors. Uh, Jackie Berry, for example, he had his big real estate company. Mm -hmm. um, the Nashes, you know, they just everybody did so much, and um, I just grew up and respected all these individuals and. Um, they were just wonderful people. I had the best, I, I think, you know, a uh, little small hometown education uh, through through older black people that I could ever have imagined. And um, I, I, my husband and I run a business today and um, it's kind of a multi-million dollar business. And um, hopefully I'm uh, carrying on that aspect of, of our Ardmore uh, ancestors. I have a question for you. The Ragsdales in Ardmore, are they the same family as the Ragsdales in Muskogee, Oklahoma? I believe so, yes. And there are there are also some Ragsdales that uh, have a business there in Phoenix. Yes, that is correct. Yes. That's, that's correct. Yeah. So that was Mervyn, Mervyn uh, I mean, sorry, uh, yeah, Lincoln Ragsdale, sorry. That was Mervyn yeah. Lackey. Mervyn yeah. Lackey was in also into school, so he was in education. While as um, Mr. Ragsdale, Lincoln Ragsdale, and his brother were 
in the funeral home business. Um, yes, yeah, so they had those. And in, in, he also was one of the flyers, one of the Red Wing flyers from Tuskegee that were um, one of the black, you know, flyers. Yeah. Yes, my, my wife is from Muskogee and she knows the Ragsdales there. Yeah, yeah, we're very familiar mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. 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 San Diego. Diego. There's Ragsdales down in San Diego. Yeah. 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 Well, That's true. We're, we're going to have to table all that for our next discussion because that's a story by itself. It is. I'm well, just going to, really? that's well, why I talked about it <laughs> because I got all those pictures too as well. But I want to close out because I want to make this interesting that you want to come back for more and I'm going to share my screen and we will talk about those Ragsdales and you are right. They are from Muskogee, Oklahoma. And there's a story behind that with black wall street, but we're going to deal with that on our next one. But right now I want to close out with this one. These are the 20 African American brothers that built Lake Murray. Mm -mm. Oh, really? Wow. Really? Was that, the, was that the CCC? The WPA. WPA, okay. Yes. On the left side, which I didn't show the picture, you can go out to Lake Murray and go look in there. When you go in the lodge, you're going to see 80 Anglo men on the left side. They built that lake, and Murray was named after the governor, same one that, that they named Murray State College there in Tishomingo, and... Yeah. And uh, and then uh, Oklahoma State University got a dorm named after him. Alpha but, Alpha Bill. Alpha Alpha Bill. Thank you. But keep in mind, twenty blacks on one side on this group picture, and eighty whites on the other side. Now here's the crazy thing about it. When I talked to Lincoln Ragsdale, the uh, the third, I had the son who lives in Arizona. He <laughs> told me that when he came to Ardmore, he went with his grandmother. They lived on Main Street because he had the funeral home. And <laughs> what happened during that time period? These men, they built Lake Murray. But check this out, Berta Verde and Sandy and Linda and Edwina, Edna, Winna. They, mm -hmm. they couldn't go to landing spot number one. They couldn't go to landing spot number two. The only place that African-Americans could go through at that time period was number three. It was segregated. Is that it was segregated, yes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, my grandfather was, was the head... Um, Mater D there at um, at Lake Mary Lodge. So that just tells you. That's why when I when I go around, I'm saying, what is the impact? What did African Americans do here in Carter County? Mm -hmm. What did they do during that time period? They did a whole lot more than you will ever yeah. imagine, or what they've they, been able to do. One one of the uh, things that distinguishes Ardmore is that per capita, it has more millionaires than any town in the world. And so, of course, they stole the land with the oil from the black folks and the Indians. And so that's how they became billionaires. And so, but they had a lot of people that were working around them, working in their homes and everything. And so they saw the lifestyle of the rich and famous. If you, in the 60s, if you went to Ardmore, and went to somebody's house on the outside, it would look very modest and, you know, just like a little brick, little uh, frame house uh, made out of wood. And then you would go in the house, inside of the house, it was so tastefully decorated. <laughs> they might be serving you lobster tail, you know, they, I mean, they knew how to live. And so that's where that ambition came from. Yeah. Everybody wanted to have that lifestyle. But in Ardmore, you couldn't flaunt it too much. So that's why they kept the outsides of their house looking plain. But when you went inside, you thought you were in, you know, Beverly Hills or someplace <laughs> like that. <laughs> Look at my screen. What do you see, Sandy? Oh, wow. That's a great photo. I bet you that's Lincoln in the back. I don't know. Is that Lincoln in the back in the middle? Mary Davison sent this to us, said, my oh, that's great. great uncles, William is the driver with his other older brothers from Muskogee, Oklahoma. Yeah, I, I what, can what, see what the was that, What was their names? What was Ragsdales. Ragsdales. Okay, okay, there we go. Okay. Oh, my wife. Ted, Ted Senior. Can you, can Ted you Senior. I'm, not muted. I'm muted. 
Ted, Ted Senior in the front on the driver's on the uh, passenger side, I think. Is that Linda over there being quiet now, speaking up? <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's the wife speaking. Uh, won't you unmute and tell us that? Go ahead. I believe, I believe that uh, from, from the pictures I've seen, seen and hello, hello everybody. everybody. Um, um, I think from the pictures I've seen, that's Ted Senior. That's, that's, that's two different things. All all you got two different things. Side 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 in the front. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Oh, did you hear me, hear me? Yeah, you had two different things going on at that I time. There was an echo. It was an echo. Oh, no, it's all of mine. That's because I'm close to Birdie, I think. Okay, yeah. go ahead now. We can hear you much better now. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go. Okay, I'll take you off on mute. Go ahead. Now try it. Okay, I'm going to uh, go ahead now. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, I believe from the pictures that I've seen growing up that um, that's Ted Jr.'s father <laughs> on the passenger side in the front seat. That's just based on the pictures that I've seen of him. Um, I grew up in Muskogee, and I do know the Ragsdales very well. And their uh, funeral home, in fact, my when my dad passed away, they were the ones that took care of him. But I've been knowing them like all my life. And I actually remember uh, Ted J Ragsdale Jr.'s dad before he passed away. Yeah. Well, all I can say to you is that we got a lot to be thankful for. And we're going to meet together again, and I hope we can do it again next Wednesday because I want to keep these series. I want them to be around forever. I'm going to post them on YouTube so that when we go into February, you know, Black History Month, we'll be able to come on. I got to get my dad on there too as well because, you know, my dad, he lives in Midwest City, Oklahoma, and uh, he uh, he could tell you some stuff that I, I had to talk to my dad uh, to calm him down because he'd been unsaid something crazy. <laughs> I had to put him in check. So I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm not going to hold him back because that would be wrong for me to do that. But I'm going to show you as we close, this is when 1950s, where my grandfather, who was a Cherokee Indian by the name of Mr. Pete Bailey II, who shined shoes in Ponca City, Oklahoma. And he came down here to Ardmore and he married my grandmother, Ollie Walker. And uh, he was out there in, um, at the air barriers, out there at, uh, you know, during that time period, uh, you know, they had, they had clubs out there in Gene Autry and Berwyn. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, um, <laughs> uh, Terry. But, but Berwyn was the spot. Dorsey, Terry, anything you want to close out and say in of, about what we talked about on the night? Because we got to wrap it up, y'all. Go ahead, Dorsey, and I'll follow you. Okay. Um, and I was talking about my grandfather owning two blocks uh, on Main Street. Two of the buildings on Main Street were hotels. And uh, the Spikner Hotel kind of got a, a bad reputation after my grandparents died. And, but anyway, at one time, uh, they were very respectable. And uh, my grandfather had a contract with the Air Force Base in, in uh, Gene Autry uh, because when the black soldiers would come, uh, if they couldn't get on base, they couldn't live in uh, the white establishments in Berwyn. So they ha my grandfather's hotels housed them. So he had a contract with the, with the, uh, with the military for that reason. And uh, so it was very lucrative. And also, um, I don't know what level of education my grandfather had, but he was born in 1867, one year after the end of the Civil War. And he was quite a businessman. Um, in addition, uh, the uh, Pullman Porters, which was one of the prestigious jobs back during that time, they would change shifts in Ardmore. And so he also housed all of the Pullman porters when they were making their shifts and going in another direction from where they had come. So he and, and I, he, he also built a, a, a funeral home in Idabel. But uh, I won't take up all the time, but I just wanted to tell you about, about the entrepreneurship of, of, of my grandfather. Well, we're going to be talking about that. And Dr. Littles, I appreciate you. Terry? Um. 
several things popped up to me because I'm always going through my little Friedman here. Um, we need to hear more of these stories and we need to document them. Like you said, you're going to uh, have a conversation with your father. Uh, the name Cox came up. We lost Sandy's mother and we did have an opportunity to get uh, an interview with her and get some of her, her stories done. I think it's imperative that the elders in our community get interviewed and, and we kind of preserve that story. Um, I, I, we are I, I, going I, I, to I be have, the elders. I have interviewed Mr. Cox. Me. I have interviewed Mr. Cox. Yes, she has. That's that's how I got it. We're gonna have to get Mr. Charlie on. I'll well, get with get over there. Okay. But the the point is, we we have to make more efforts like that. Um, when we talked earlier, Mr. Bailey, you were in the uh, Ardmore uh, Southwestern Museum, and what was it you said to me about that? I said, you recall? I there and I walked through it and I saw it and I thought it was all nice and everything, but when I walked out, I asked him the question, "Where are the African Americans?" Exactly. Exactly. So we can't depend on others to tell and preserve our story. We have the tools with Zoom like this to capture those stories, uh, to publish those stories. And I think, again, it's an imperative because if we don't, it's going to be lost. We know where the uh, film for uh, Carl Rhodes is located. And yep. that needs to be preserved before it is deteriorates even further. Okay. Yep. So we have a lot of work to do. And I think, I hope that this is just a start because we, we, we didn't really get into a whole lot of other stuff that we need to be talking about. You're right about you know? that. And as a matter of fact, I seen a question that came up on the chat and I didn't want to leave it. Any chance uh, of a night other than Wednesday of a Bible study and Linda. So uh, you guys, uh, we will understand for Wednesday night. We could possibly go to a Thursday night or we could go to a Tuesday night. So you guys just let us know. And uh, Terry, uh, would you I'm give flexible. me- I'm flexible. Yeah, Tuesday is good for me too as well. Um, so we can we can do that and we can go with next Tuesday night or so and do that during that time period. But Terry, give out your email and how they can contact you and Dr. Littles. Give um, out it's, it's video agree on, I'm gonna type it in the chat. And then tell them too, because people that are watching can watch, can reach out to you. Okay, video grill at gmail.com. Okay. Um, I can be reached there. Um, there's so much that I need to be doing. I think I'm, I've kind of made 2023 the year that I have to start publishing yes. because the stories that I have need to be gotten out. Uh, I'll be set. This year. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I got more years behind me than I got in front of me. Well, you know, I was, I was like you. I was in the gym with them little weights and everything. You know, I was, Bernie inspired me to get out there. <laughs> you know, so, you know, we have to take care of our bodies. Yes, and we're going to do that. How can they reach you? I see it. D D S Littles at OU dot EDU. D S Littles at OU.edu, correct, Dr. Littles? That's correct. All right. Dr. Emeritus, right? Yeah. And so I'm going to say, and my email address is going to be baileycedric at hotmail.com. If any questions, any concerns, let us know. But like Terry said, we're going to save the big one. The big one is the story of Carl Rhodes. That's all I can say. Yeah. That is going to be the big one. Yeah. I've, been, I've been dying to get to his film. You know, I have a background in photography, so I've been dying to well, get we to know his where film. It is. And here's a picture of my <laughs> grandfather. That's Mr. John Bailey the third right there with his wife. And uh, I, I'll tell you the story how I got a chance. Is, is, your, is, is your that's, grandfather on the right? That's my grandfather. He looks familiar. He looks that's, familiar. He is, is a Cherokee Indian, and he lived in Ponca City, Oklahoma. That is my grandfather, Mr. John Bailey. Okay. And I will tell you a story about him on the next time and tell you about his father too as well because there were a lot of stories and it goes back to the story, Bertie, that you talked about earlier about that name change. There was a lot of stuff that go on that, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but there was stuff that went on back in the day. Where, where, was, where was that background? Where, were they, where was that picture taken? 
That I don't know where it was. My dad gave that picture to me. My yeah. dad has a lot of stuff. And I had to kind of like, like I said, when I get my dad on, you need to put your seatbelt on when you talk to him. <laughs> it was an interesting story. Because my my dad, my grandfather had chickens. That's what he had. And my uncle lived on Second Street. He had pear trees. He had chickens. He had a garden. You know, and that's what they did. You know, the only place that we was able to get any groceries, we went to Hunt's, Frazier's, and Lastly's, and we went there and got our groceries on credit, and they had a tab for you, and you mm -hmm. paid it at the end of the month. Does that sound right, Bertie? Mm hmm Yeah. And that's how you did it, you know. But people, a, a handshake during that time period, a person's word was their bond. Hey, listen, I got to go. I want to say thank everybody for being on board with us today. I hope that you enjoyed what we had to share about the history of Ardmore from an African-American perspective. I call it the untold story. I thank you so much and everybody hold on right afterwards as I stop this recording and there'll be more to come, so stay tuned. Be sure to share this video and thank you for watching. Thank you, thank you.